Senate Tax Committee on um, Wednesday, February 15th. Uh, first item is uh, approval of the minutes. They're in your folders. Um, are there any corrections? Seeing none, the minutes stand approved as presented. The first item on our <coughs> excuse me uh, on our uh, agenda today, the first um, bill is Senator Nelson's House Senate File fifteen twelve. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Senator Madam Nelson, Chair. Um, welcome, and um, please present your bill. I uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to move uh, Senate File One Five One Two. It's the New Markets Tax Credit Proposal, and uh, I could I could give the bill to you in one sentence, but that wouldn't quite give enough information. Yeah, but basically, I do want to just provide some scaffolding uh, to build the, our uh, testimony on today. Uh, Senate File 1512 mirrors the federal new market tax credit. Senate File 1512 would establish a Minnesota new markets tax credit, which would mirror the federal new markets tax credit. And just as... Um, just a little bit more scaffolding. We know in this community that pairing a state credit on top of a federal credit uh, makes Minnesota much more valuable in getting those federal dollars. So uh, Senate file uh, 1512, before I start, I want to uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for hearing the bill. And I'd also like to thank uh, the bill's co-sponsors. Uh, that would be uh, Chair Rest, Senator Klein, Senator Dietzik and Senator Weber. Uh, and so this bill presents, uh, creates a state level uh, program that mirrors the successful federal new markets tax credit. And it funds private capital to support growth in impoverished or low income neighborhoods. And you will find in your, as we move further, you'll find uh, maps showing those neighborhoods that would be qualified uh, based on U.S. Census tracts uh, defined by the federal government that are eligible for the federal new market tax credit. This bill creates that state level program. It builds uh, the federal funds, uh, private capital to support growth in those uh, in underserved communities in all corners of our state. High level things you'd like to know. Uh, the program would enable $120 million of growth capital to be invested in Minnesota businesses within 12 months of the program starting, uh, putting those funds to work in communities that need them most uh, without delay. Uh, one thing to keep in mind as uh, we go through the bill is that there is great federal oversight here. Only, only uh, community development entities that have already been granted a federal new markets tax credit would be eligible <coughs> to also get the Minnesota new markets tax credit. Why is that? It's a, it's a good question, Madam Chair. I think it's an extra level of security knowing that um, these... Community development entities have also been approved by the federal level and are eligible at the federal level. Uh, and so it's an extra level of security for Minnesota. And actually, this credit is really designed to build upon that federal new market tax credit to make it even so we would capture more of that money. Just as a, uh, just as a number to kind of hold in the back of our thoughts, uh, the federal government has set aside $5 billion for uh, new market tax credits. Uh, each year. It's a significant amount of money. And uh, we'd like to be uh, one of the several states, um, I think there's probably 11 if I remember correctly, states that already have a new market tax credit. Um, and so if you can pair your federal new market tax credit with a similar treating of Minnesota tax uh, liability as well, uh, it just makes those states more likely 
uh, to, to get some of that uh, investment. And we've seen that, like with the um, historic tax credit, for example, mirroring uh, what the federal feds do and then having a Minnesota one. We also saw that, uh, Madam Chair and committee members, with the um, film credit as well, mm -hmm. uh, stacking our Minnesota credit on top of the federal credit. Uh, I, do not, I do not know that those require federal credits in order to, uh, but, but this one does. It's just an extra level of security for Minnesota. So Senator Nelson, I, I'm sure there are gonna be questions. Would you, yes. I think it would be good if you would go through um, the major provisions of the, of the bill first, yes. and, then, and then we can come back to questions, if, if, that's, um, if that's okay with you. Yes, Madam Chair, I'd be glad to do that. I did want to give just that little bit of background so sure. that you had an idea Appreciate where we're it. headed. Um, and so you have the bill in front of you, members, and I'll just kind of walk through it very briefly, section by section, yep. um, and we can dwell deeper as we go, as we'd like. Um, number one, uh, sections uh, one and two, one just adds, and two both have to do with data practices uh, regarding information, uh, regarding uh, applicants for the new market tax credit, and classifies the data on individuals as private and allows the data to deed, this is uh, through deed, by the way, Madam Chair, uh, to uh, release information needed to make sure that the, uh, to, to keep the program, to evaluate the program. Um, section three is probably one of the more uh, interesting pieces for you to look at, and that's the new market definitions. Um, and certainly it talks about the credit allowed, uh, the qualification, the limitations. And I think one thing to understand, uh, which would probably fit right in here, is the uh, CDFIs, federally designated uh, entities that get the $5 billion from the federal government, mm -hmm. then they take that money and give that to what's called community qualified community development entities, and you'll see that in subdivision two, uh, for, uh, for that investment. Uh, you'll note that the investment can be claimed against both income and corporate franchise tax or the insurance premium tax, but obviously not both. Uh, Subdivision three just talks about the qualified community development entities and their application. Uh, what you might want to know, it's to the commissioner of deed, uh, and then it includes a $5,000 non-refundable application fee to offset the cost to administer the credit. Where is, where is, I see, never mind, I see yep. it. Yep, that's in a subdivision. Page five. Yeah. Okay, if you're following the bill, yes. And then uh, subdivision four is the certification and timing of those qualified equity investments. Um, and that um, uh, requires, it has the timelines in there where DEED has to uh, approve uh, those investments. Uh, and notice that um, the community development uh, entity must provide evidence of receipt of the cash investment and designate 50% of the qualified equity investment under the requirements of the federal new market tax credit. So you're going to see that a lot. We're mirroring the federal new market tax credit. If it, it, uh, and then we talk about subdivision five, credit recapture. That's kind of like if, if there's a problem and someone hasn't kept their uh, promises, uh, then of course, how can those credits be recaptured? Again, there's just a lot of safety mechanisms in here uh, for Minnesota. And again, these mirror the federal uh, new market tax credit. Um, and then uh, subdivision six just allows the commissioner of deed to conduct examinations to verify that the credits have been received, have been applied under the requirements. Again, very, um, very um, specific uh, that we follow the federal new market tax credits and we have a lot of uh, security here in Minnesota. Uh, subdivision seven uh, is the annual reporting by those community development entities. Uh, and that's an annual report to deed. And uh, it must include information about the low income community investments made. That's what we want to see as, uh, as taxpayers. Uh, is that money getting to low income communities and is how many jobs is it producing? Um, there's a more program report. It talks about um, uh, dis some disclosure things. Uh, it, it, section five talks about how it's not refundable. We know a lot about tax credits in this uh, committee. So it's a non-refundable tax credit, uh, but it can be carried over for five years. Uh, so that's something we're quite familiar with. Um, and uh, section uh, six uh, t talks about that it could be used for the 
uh, for the uh, insurance premiums as well. And I think there's also a document in your folders that, because it took me a long time to kind of understand the progression of the investment. And I believe there's a document in your folders that kind of talks about this, that shows one, the um, community development entities request funds from, uh, from the Department of Deed, uh, and Deed uh, then um, uh, grants those funds according to the stipulations in the bill. That's the high level, and if you'd like, uh, we can go through more. But the one thing I do want you to know, it's, it is very much based off of the, um, internet, uh, the IRC Code 45D, which is the federal new markets tax credit. So um, um, <clears throat> just some more um, informational questions. What other states have um, a similar program, if not identical? Madam Chair? I have that list, but it'll take me a moment to get to it. Is that it. in our package? Um, just a moment. Or I might ask, um, I might ask Ms. Paul. One of your Paul. testifiers may. Yeah, oh, my, pes my testifiers will have okay. that information anyway, for you. to go to that. Um, yes. <clears throat> we have um, had this proposal or a similar one before us before, and I'm trying to recall um, uh, a number of years ago, I think we had, there was a, um, there were federal zones that were created um, uh, for specific kinds of um, investment. Um, and I don't know if they were called enterprise zones or something like that. Um, is is this an offshoot of that, and does that program, I mean, I don't think Minnesota has that program anymore, but I was just wondering um, if that if that was something um, similar, and as I recall, it, uh, it was used by border cities and, and groups like that, or, you know, groups of cities like that. Um, is, do you recall, uh, Ms. Pollock? Um, Madam Chair, members, yes, I I do recall the federally designated zones. I think it was something like enterprise or empowerment zones. Yes. Um, and there have been, um, I think, border city state tax incentive programs. Um, I, I think um, a number of those um, have sunset or expired, mm -hmm. but I, I would want to make sure, and I can certainly get back to the committee. It on might those. be interesting, Senator Nelson. Um, as we go forward with this, I mean, the, to start with, there's not a um, there's not a huge revenue uh, impact, as you know, because it's, start, it's a startup. But to look at the history of <clears throat> um, perhaps similar programs, or maybe your testifiers could uh, tell us about that too, and either how this is an improvement, or it's an alternative, or it's nothing like what we had before. I think that would be. Um, that would be very um, uh, that would be very instructive as we consider putting this um, brand new program uh, in our own tax code. But um, <clears throat> I do think um, that it um, uh, should be of interest um, not only for uh, Senator Dibble, not only looking at the map uh, for the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, these maps that she held, handed out, uh, the eligible areas are in, in purple. And um, uh, at some point, maybe a comment from you about where those areas are in Minneapolis, because some of us don't know. And then, um, uh, and of course, um, Senator Nelson, the map that shows Rochester, um, <clears throat> where is that in Rochester kind oh. of thing, okay? And, you know, and like, uh, you don't have to tell us where you live, but, you know, sure. if this, is this part of your district or whatever? And then, um, uh, Senator Putnam, um, if you look at the map, the uh, New Markets Tax Credit eligible areas, there's a map that's showing St. Cloud, 
and I think we'd welcome comment from you about what that area, those purple areas in, in those maps um, are. Or I, I would certainly um, welcome that. Uh, any other general questions before we get to um, before we get to the um, uh, uh, testifier, Senator Klein, you had a general question. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I think my question may be for Council Ms. Pollack, uh, although the author perhaps has insight as well. <clears throat> but I'm interested in the reporting um, provisions within the bill, Subdivision Seven. It looks like there's quite a bit of reporting back to the commissioner. Um, and then Subdivision 8 has some language around reporting back to the legislature, and that's the part I'm interested in. Um, how will what we... Page is that on? Uh, page 10, line 6. Um, how will we as a legislature or future legislatures sort of evaluate the success or failure of this program? And I, I didn't fully understand um, if the credit under this XYZ, and, and maybe Ms. Pollock, you could explain to me uh, what sort of reporting the legislature will receive back on this program. Mad Madam Chair, Senator Ms. Klein, um, the reference on 10.7, uh, if the credit under this section has not been reviewed under the provisions of uh, 3.8855, um, that is the Tax Expenditure Review Commission statutory site. So this would be saying that if the Tax Expenditure Review Commission has not reviewed this credit by that uh, December 15th of 2032, then the Commissioner of Deed, along with the Commissioner of Revenue, should um, provide a report to the legislature. So as you may recall, the Tax Expenditure Review Commission um, is tasked with reviewing um, our tax expenditures um, on kind of a, a rolling basis. And so they select any number of expenditures to review at a time. And so if for whatever reason this credit um, does not fall into their review schedule by 2032, then there, a, a, a separate report would be required under this subdivision eight. Sure. Uh, Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I had one specific question and then one general question. Sure. If now is the appropriate time or we could wait until after testimony. Why don't you go ahead and ask, ask it now because the testifiers may be able to respond to it as well as Great. Senator Nelson. Great. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, did you? Oh, it looked like Senator Nelson yeah. wanted to speak first. Okay. The, the, the specific question, um, very, very fine-grained question. Um, on line 5.10 to 5.12, it looks like the commissioner has uh, 30 days um, uh, to, um, uh, uh, not less than 30 days, but not more than 45 days uh, after the date the CDFI fund announces allocation awards. Uh, actually, that's not what I, I, I was trying to find the section where um, the, the commissioner had only 30 days, I read it in a review somewhere, um, 30 days to um, approve of the application. Maybe that is the section, I'm not reading it right. But I'm just wondering, um, have we checked? Is that enough time? I know we often put timelines on the uh, agencies. I totally understand and sympathetic with that. Otherwise, things drag out forever and you know the world moves on at a different pace than maybe government does. But um, do we know that that's sufficient time yes. for the Senator agency? Nelson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. That is a very good question. Mm -hmm. And yes, uh, and it also reminds me that I must, uh, so yes, DEED has been very involved with this proposal. Uh, so the bill that we, we passed, the New Markets Tax Credit in our Minnesota State Senate, bipartisan, you know, supported a tax bill off the floor. And it was part of that conference committee report uh, that was um, approved, ad adopted by both the House and Senate in 2022. But what happened between when it passed off the Senate floor and when we approved it in the conference committee report is we worked very diligently with DEED. And so what you see before you is, is uh, some, in, something that has come uh, through a DEED. The commissioner has been very good uh, to work on this. And um, I would assume this was their language. I, I can't speak to that, but I can tell you that they're very aware of this bill and have really had a fine hand in helping refine the bill from what we supported in 2022. Senator you. Dibble, do you have a further then, um, comment? Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, then uh, and I, I think your suggestion is a good one, um, so I'll let um, Senator Nelson and her testifiers know what I'll be listening for um, in the testimony is um, why a tax credit in, uh, approach um, to solving in addressing the problems that these resources will be directed to, you know, investing in in uh, low-income communities and their businesses is preferable to 
um, an appropriation or you know some other approaches that we might have uh, around investing in these communities. Because of course, you know, tax credits aren't private money. It's mobilizing private money, sure. but it's then of course replaced with public money through the tax credit mechanism. And so there are always questions about um, whether direct appropriation is is the better idea or if tax credits are the better. Sometimes they are because they incent relationships and incent certain kinds of behaviors. Sometimes they're not because you know there's a lot of administrative overhead and, and uh, inefficiency that goes along with it. And so it's been a fairly active conversation here at the Capitol in years past. I haven't heard it recently, but I remember when I was last on the tax committee and the House brought in this whole idea about we're not doing tax credits anymore. Everything's a direct appropriation. And there was some good, there was good analysis about why sometimes tax expenditure effort tax credit um, really is a way to kind of hide the ball in what really should be public effort. So that's what I'm going to be listening for in terms of the public policy choice we've made here. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Senator Dibble. Um, <clears throat> Senator Nelson, do you want to go to your testify? Yes, uh, and Madam Chair, while they're coming to the table, uh, I'll, I'll have, uh, I have two testifiers today. If they both could come up uh, to the table, please. And just to uh, Senator Dibble's point, a very good point on the cost of administering tax credits. And uh, you will notice, I'm sure the testifiers will mention, I mentioned the $5,000 non-refundable application fee. There's also a $1,500 fee every year uh, to those entities. And again, the point is, to, to your point, uh, we don't want state government to pay for that necessary oversight. Uh, we, we believe that uh, the um, program itself uh, through those funds should. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Welcome to the um, uh, committee who is going to begin. Alex. I'll start. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee. My name is Alex Stepanek, and I work for a company called Vantage Capital. We're, uh, we're an impact investor that for about the last 30 years has been investing in low-income and underserved communities uh, through programs like the New Markets Tax Credit. We'll give a little bit of an overview today on that federal program and how it's worked in other states, uh, and then we'll work to address some of the, the questions that have been raised here. So. Uh, this is a program that first passed in 2000 at the federal level. It's been renewed by every administration since through to the Biden administration. Now it awards $5 billion a year to uh, community development entities, uh, groups like Advantage Capital, Sunrise Bank, and about 300 others across the country. It's a pretty high bar to, to hit to be able to get a portion of that allocation because you've got to show that you have a track record of investing in these communities and you have a plan in place that shows you can actually go in and do the work. And so as part of that, uh, what happened was these CDEs could take, <clears throat> excuse me, could take these funds anywhere, and so some states were getting a lot, and some states were getting very little. So in about 2007, states started passing these state-level new markets tax credit programs to attract more of these funds. And there are 14 states since then have passed a new markets tax credit bill. Uh, there are, they have, between all of them, have renewed them 33 times as well. Um, and the idea behind it is bring more of those funds to, to your state. So states like Ohio, Kentucky, Illinois, Missouri, uh, Nebraska have passed these programs. And I'll stay in Nebraska for a moment. When they first passed their program, right before they were getting $4 per capita uh, in new mark, federal new markets investment. They passed their program in 2012, and then shortly after, they were receiving $52 per capita. It was a 13x increase in the amount of federal funds going to their state. And all of that flows to the businesses, right? the small businesses and the nonprofits in these communities that want to grow, need to grow, but can't find the capital to grow. Uh, I have testified in front of this committee last year and talked about an entrepreneur in North Omaha who was a, trying to buy back ownership of her business, which was, which was a 70 person call center. Uh, and she wanted to expand. She couldn't find the financing to do so. And so she found it through the New Markets Tax Credit Program. And then she was able to take off. And she grew her business to about 250 employees. She refinanced out the New Markets investment that she got because it bridged her through to a long-term banking relationship that was able to fund further expansions. She ended up becoming one of the Inc. 5000 fastest growing businesses in the country. And she's the largest minority and women-owned business in the state. And since I sat here last year, she's broken ground on a new facility still in North Omaha that she's going to have her entire headquarters at. It was on a previous, previously vacant plot of land in, down, in North Omaha. And she's also building a retail space and uh, housing. 
because she wants people to stay in North Omaha, work in North Omaha, and live there. And that is, that is really what the goal of this program is. There isn't, uh, it's not state programs that, that do that. It's inspired and driven entrepreneurs. And state programs like New Markets uh, help those entrepreneurs at the time, get them, they get capital at the time when they need it, where they need it. And a program like this in Minnesota will create that opportunity for more entrepreneurs across, across the entire state. Um, I would like to address uh, a few of the questions here, particularly around opportunity zones, if I may, Madam Chair. Um, please do. Okay, so I believe it was opportunity zones was the, the program. Uh, it was opportunity zones and enterprise zones that in recent years uh, came up, I believe it was around 2017. And in those programs, uh, they most often built on similar practices. The goal was drive more funds to low income areas. And uh, they actually built a lot on what New Markets was doing. So in an Opportunity Zones map, you're going to see a lot of overlap. I think the overlap in Opportunity Zones and New Markets, uh, every Opportunity Zone was in a New Markets area, but not every New Markets area was in an Opportunity Zone. So, And were the Opportunity Zones federally defined yeah. as well? They were federally defined, but it was up to each state to, um, yes, Madam Chair, the, they were up to each state to decide where the Opportunity Zones were. And, and um, was uh, <clears throat> Ms. Pollock reminds me for some of us, um, that the Minnesota program was called Job Z. Do you remember? That? I do. Uh, Job Z program. So um, we have um, we have gone down this path and uh, um, before, and so it's exciting to see an, a new wrinkle on it um, as we uh, consider uh, <clears throat> this relationship with the federal government as well. But. Um, you may, you may continue. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd also like to address the, uh, the tax credit versus appropriation piece. Um, so Senator Dibble, you asked about why a tax credit. Uh, in a program like this, it is a public-private partnership. And the whole goal behind that is bring in the private market to be able to get into these small communities that might be all over the state and really go out and have reach across the entire, the entire state. So when you have a, a tax credit program, uh, the goal on this would be to bring in the private sector and uh, allow them to raise all the capital up front with the allocation of the tax credits. So that way they can bring in investors and now you're bringing in groups from all over, not just the state, but all over the country to be able to uh, do the work up front before there's the, uh, the benefit of a, uh, or before there's a fiscal note to the state. And with an appropriation model, it, it's not as easy to do. You can't come in and create and bring in investors into the fund that will help allow uh, these programs to quickly, quickly be raised. Um, so that way, the goal is to get the money uh, raised as fast as possible, to get it into the state and get it to work as fast as possible, um, and then with a delayed fiscal note. Senator Dibble? Yeah, um, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, I probably need to understand that a little bit more. I'm not opposed. I just, you know, it's a, it's a policy choice that we make. And um, sometimes we think, oh, tax credit sounds great, but it really is public expenditure, public effort. And so, so we know, just so we're clear, I mean, there's $120 million uh, <clears throat> appropriation that comes with this. Senator so. Dibble, and we do have, you know, other tax credit programs for um, overall economic development, the angel investment credit, the investment credit itself, which sometimes we have and sometimes we don't, <laughs> and, and depending on how much money uh, uh, <clears throat> we want to make um, uh, available. And um, I think there are others, those are the two that come right to mind, but there are others that we've tried um, as well to uh, stimulate um, private investment in <clears throat> Minnesota efforts, I think. So. Okay. So Madam Chair, I'm, I've been supportive of the historic yeah, it's uh, like rehabilitation the you know, work structure, the, rehabilitation tax credit. If the timing is right for some of these things right. to, to um, act when, uh, right. uh, when we sense that um, this is a good time mm -hmm. to encourage this kind of investment. Right. I just um, the reason I raise the subject is because we think tax credits. So oh, private money. It's it's not. It's public money, um, and and it's a it's a policy choice we make. Right. So, thank you. Um, 
Your second, um, uh, Senator Driscowski first. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is my first time seeing this bill, but um, it's very intriguing. Um, I want to understand it better. So, and I heard the testifier, so there's federal money, and that's grant money, um, that comes to these local community entities. Now, do we have these community entities in Minnesota now, or they would be developed? Um, if you could describe those. Um, and then there's private investment that comes into these community entities. So there's really two, two pieces of income coming into these community entities. There's private development that gets the tax credit, and then there's federal money that's grant money. Is that correct? Am I, am I understanding it correctly? No, I'm not. Okay. Go ahead. Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Senator. So the, the program at the federal level is their allocation of federal tax credits. So it's not grant money. Those tax credits okay. come in and they have to, it would work very similar to the way this would. So uh, tax credits come in and then a group like Advantage Capital, if we receive a portion of those tax credits, we have to go raise a fund and those are only a portion of that entire fund. So if it's a $10 million fund, uh, it might be $3 million of it would be the tax credits and then it's up to the Advantage Capital to go find the other $7 million to go put out in the state. Or okay. in, and this, it works the same way at the state level as well. Okay, so you want to match up, but uh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Senator Shrowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, so you want to match up a, a, a state tax credit with the federal ones coming in to really widen the bandwidth um, there. What what is what does the community development entity look like? What what is it, Madam Chair? Mr. Stepanek. Uh, so, Senator, there the. Investors that span a pretty broad array. We're, we're a private investor, so we only invest in low-income and rural communities. Uh, but my, my co-testifier here uh, works for Sunrise Bank. And so it's, it's community development-focused arms of banks. It's community development-focused investors uh, that are spend all of their time investing in these communities. So the community development entities are the ones that have to go get certified by the federal program and then when they receive those funds, they have to go out and actually do the work to put it together. So when a state passes a program, there's, you mentioned, you asked how many uh, community development entities are in the state currently. I believe there's six that have received federal allocation in, over the lifetime of the program. Um, and most recently, I believe it was just Sunrise Bank, that was the Minnesota um, CDE that received a federal allocation. It's very competitive. And so trying to bring a state program in uh, creates more opportunity for those CDEs to, that are in the state to bolster their application, get more federal awards, uh, which then brings even more money to the state. Additionally, you're going to bring in out-of-state investors, like an Advantage Capital. I'm from St. Louis. Um, but we can take the federal allocation anywhere, and there are a lot of groups like ours that uh, traditionally will look for state programs to come bring the funds to. So you bolster the in-state CDE groups that do this, and you bring in outside investors that are bringing more federal funds to the state. Senator Doskowski, I wonder if we might hear from the other witness yeah, who's thank you, Madam the, Chair. from Sunrise mm -hmm. Banks and, and just how that's the other part of the equation here. Um, welcome to the... Um, Committee, Mr. Stepanek, don't go away. I will. Okay, all right. Um, uh, um, Ms. Stoic, is yes. that correct? Yes. Um, uh, welcome to the committee. Identify yourself, and we're, we welcome your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair, Senators, fellow guests. My name is Mary Stoic. I'm the Director of Tax Credit Lending for Sunrise Banks. Sunrise Banks is a family owned community bank based here in St. Paul. Uh, we've been involved with the Federal New Market Tax Credits Program since 2008. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to you today about this proposed state program and express our support. I'd like to start by telling you a story and help you understand how this helps real people and real businesses in our state. Tom Peterson was born and raised on a family farm in Owatonna. He'd been working in the HVAC industry for 14 years when he decided to design and build his own equipment out of his home. And that was over 30 years ago. Tom and his wife, Susan, have since grown that HVAC equipment business to a $40 million company that is still based in Owatonna. And in fact, that company, Climate by Design, is experiencing such strong demand for its products that it has entirely outgrown its building, and it needs a new facility. CDI's high-quality and high-paying manufacturing jobs are badly needed in Owatonna. And this past fall, an allocation of federal 
new market tax credits helped that company break ground on the construction of a new $34 million manufacturing facility that will create at least 145 new full-time jobs and retain 155 full-time jobs, all paying competitive wages, offering full benefits, and providing key employment and career path opportunities for people living in the Owatonna community. The building itself is located in a census tract whose median income is less than 64% of the state's average. Two-thirds of those jobs are accessible to individuals with no more than a high school diploma. And in fact, the company actively seeks to hire as much as possible from the local community, including through partnership with local high schools, and train its employees for internal advancement. In addition to helping businesses grow and create and retain quality jobs, the New Market Tax Credits program can also help nonprofit organizations provide and expand services to underserved communities. In 2018, Sunrise was able to leverage New Markets to help Crescent Cove build the first children's hospice home in the state of Minnesota and just the third in the United States. This amazing place provides respite and hospice care to over 80 kids annually from around the state. Over 70% of those services go to low-income families. Crescent Cove has also brought 17 high-paying, skilled jobs to a census tract with nearly a 30% poverty rate and average median income of over 45%. I've been working in this field for over five years now, and I can say with confidence these stories are not unique. <laughs> Businesses and nonprofits across Minnesota experience needs like this every year. Sunrise has participated in the federal program since 2008, and we have been fortunate enough to receive seven allocation awards to date, totaling just under $350 million. These have helped facilitate projects across the Twin Cities, including in West St. Paul, South Minneapolis, Brooklyn Center, and the east side of St. Paul. But beyond the Twin Cities, our fellow community development entities have invested in over 200 federal new market tax credits projects across the state, ranging from places like Ely, Duluth, and St. Cloud to Winona, Worthington, and Red Lake. The impact of this tool is tremendous. The need for economic investment in struggling communities across our state cannot be underestimated. The benefits of this program go to census tracts where we see high poverty rates, lower than average median income rates, high unemployment. It provides resources and incentive for renovation and rehabilitation of damaged or abandoned buildings, environmental remediation, rent accessibility for small businesses, access to health care in medically underserved communities, and access to healthy food in food deserts. I'm confident many of you in this room have businesses and nonprofits in your district that would benefit from this program, and I urge you to support the bill. I'm also happy to take any questions, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, um, Stuart. Further, um, further questions or comments? Um, Senator Nelson, go right ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I just want to give a little bit more information that might answer Thank the questions you. before they're coming, because these were some of my questions. Uh, so as you look at the maps before you, and you see those purple areas that would be eligible, and I can talk like what it looks like in Rochester, but the most important thing I want you to know is how is it that the feds define these particular uh, areas as being eligible? What is the criteria? Because that gets to really what we're thinking about here. Uh, it, there's, there's only two criteria to be eligible. One is it must that area must have a poverty rate of at least 20%. Or the area must have a median family income below 80% of the statewide family income. So that's, that's where these, these investments would go in those particular areas. And you'll see we have a number of them uh, throughout our state. Senator uh, Nelson, what's the second? Oh, the second one is. Eligibility, would you say that one? The is second one, uh, it, that, those areas must have a median family income um, below 80% so of the statewide. The area, the area median income? Or, well, no, or this is different? the median statewide family income. That's why there's two options. One can be below 20%. Uh, of a poverty rate, or uh, 80 percent uh, below 80 percent of the statewide family income, and we know that those income rates vary across the state. I think that's why there's two different criteria there uh, to choose from. And then um, one other piece that we haven't mentioned yet that I think is important for the committee to know is the and uh, Senator Rest has alluded to it uh, in that the investment comes soon, but the credits come later. So the first year, there's 0% tax credit, second, 0% tax credit, and then 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%. And the reason is we want to make sure those investments in these uh, 
uh, defined uh, impoverished census tracts actually get the money uh, to invest in their economic development right in those census tracts, the jobs, uh, and, and the businesses in those census tracts. And then the last piece that I think might get to uh, one of Senator Dibble's questions has to do about leveraging uh, public dollars. I mean, these tax credits are public incentives. That's what tax credits are. They're public incentive. And so this bill leverage, leverages this public incentive, the tax credits, to attract private investment. And so that's often been the challenge in some of our neighborhoods. We cannot get the private investment into those neighborhoods to develop the needed uh, economic and business structure and jobs. And so this bill is very different as opposed to many of the other things we do in that it actually is a public incentive to attract that private investment that will uh, build jobs uh, throughout our state. And it's the total overall emphasis is uh, it's just an economic development tool where there's been a demonstrated gap uh, in the financing structure. And you know, you, I'll just take an aside and say this goes all the way back to Brown versus the Board of Education. That was the issue there, is that there wasn't the funding in the particular areas to support the needed public schools. Well, this is what we're seeing here. We want to make sure that we have an incentive to get the funding needed into census, uh, a lower income census tracts across our state so that the, uh, the uh, private investment will be there to drive those businesses and jobs. Okay, um, Senator Putnam. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Nelson, for this bill. Um, I have to admit, though, I'm still kind of struggling to get my little brain around it. Um, as I look at this map, it's essentially coextensive with my district. Uh, Pardon me? As I look at this map here of St. Cloud, this is essentially coextensive with my district. This is my neighborhood that mm -hmm. would be impacted by something like this. So I'm trying to think through an illustration uh, in my own head that would make sense. I got this friend has a nonprofit, uh, works with a lot of East African folks. He himself is Somali. It's a very well-established nonprofit. And he was talking to me a couple weeks ago about how he wants to build a building that would have retail on the first floor, childcare on the first floor, and then some housing on the second and third floor. Is this the kind of thing that he would apply for and he'd get money for it? Senator Nelson? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, this new market tax credit would be helpful in that it would bring private investment into what he's looking to do. And that has been the challenge in a number of these tracks is we can't get the private sector to invest because, well, maybe they, they're, they're, they thought they're, the, it was too risky or whatever. And that's where we put the private, uh, the public incentive for those investors. It's an equity investment for them to invest in these areas that need that private capital to grow. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Anyone else have a, a comment um, or a um, question? Senator Nelson, um, do would you like to finish up? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. I really appreciate the spirited discussion here at this table. The, I, I believe this is an incredible opportunity for us to drive public investment into parts of our state where it has been lacking. And that's really what this bill does. And you might, and it also comes then with the additional uh, structure of the federal new market tax credit. In other words, not just anyone would be able to get our Minnesota new market tax credit. They would already have had to pass the rigor of getting a federal new market tax credit. And so this would be on top of that federal new market tax credit in how we treat uh, our Minnesota uh, income. And again, uh, it's a critical area way to drive private investment. So I think that might be the part that we need to get our mind around. This is not a tax credit to a particular business or a particular entity or wonderful things like the angel investment tax credit that we've been work, worked on so long. This is a tax, a tax credit to drive and leverage, I think I, we might have forgotten the word leverage, to leverage private investment 
in these particular census tracts. And um, Madam Chair, in, to answer your question, in the map regarding Rochester, yes. um, parts of this is in my district, but a good deal of it is, is not. It's in uh, Senator Bolden's district. So it's in, in both of our districts, but what's so interesting, if you look at that Rochester would, one, it's like yeah, a 45 degree angle. If you would characterize what, um, what that area is like. Is Look. it rural? Is it oh, suburban? Yes. Is it industrial? What um, What is it like? And Senator Putnam, I'm going to ask you the same thing, and Senator Dietzik and and Dibble, if you'd talk to us a little bit about Minneapolis. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so the purple swath that you see in the new markets tax credit eligible areas, as defined by the feds, in Rochester, that purple diagonal, it's quite interesting. You'll see a little white spot right in the middle where it doesn't qualify. And that is our downtown area, like right where Mayo, Mayo Clinic is, all right? And then if you go to the southeast, you will see that that area expands. And as you're closer to the core of the city, much of that area is apartments. And particularly, this a southeast part of Rochester, uh, nearer into the city center itself, is where a lot of our newest um, Americans come. Uh, we have a large, uh, we have a very large Somali population in Rochester. Uh, much of it is right in this area here. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of good Somali uh, businessmen as well, and women. Um, and then on the northwest uh, part, again, there's a lot of a multiple, uh, multiple housing there. So um, apartments in that area as well. Um, and I also believe, uh, it's a little hard to tell from this map, but as you look at that southeast corner and as it spreads out, I think part of that also might include Senator Driskowski's new district as well. We'd have to blow it up to look. But um, and then across the state, as you look at the map, maps, and I'll have other members speak to this, it does include rural areas and it includes metro areas. And I think we may have forgotten to note that uh, half of the investment must be in rural Minnesota, not metro, and half of it must be in metro as defined by the seven county metro area. Um, <clears throat> Senator, um, uh, Senator Putnam, if you would tell us what that area is in St. Paul. And again, there's there's um, white spots where it's, uh, they wouldn't be eligible, but there's a great deal of purple. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And I would, I would point out that that's a deep purple uh, throughout uh, my district. Uh, you'll see that uh, similar to what Senator Nelson was mentioning, there's a kind of white bubble in the middle, uh, and that's our downtown area. Yeah. Um, okay. Then uh, directly south of that, is an area that's essentially kind of affluent suburbia, uh, the kind of mountain that's sticking up right beneath the, uh, uh, the only other area of the area that's not deep purple. Is, but, in, is any of that your district? All of this is. Oh, all of it all is. All this is, except for there's a portion that would be under Senator Howe on the far uh, west part. Um, right. But the rest of it, that's all me. Uh, and one of the things I think is fascinating about this is similar to what Senator Nelson was mentioning. If you look, uh, at the, the sort of west triangle, the southwestern triangle that's sticking out there. That's Haven Township. That's all farms. That's mm -hmm. mostly farms out there. Similarly, just north of that is just a largely farm area, agricultural area. But it also includes, if you see the sort of uh, area kind of in the center of the map, Waite Park, which is 80% apartment dwellers uh, and 45% people of color. Uh, so it's... Uh, Yet further testimony of the tremendous diversity and awesomeness of the St. Cloud area, but it is also discouraging to see the level of impoverishment that is deep and widespread. And um, Senator Dietrich and Senator Dibble, um, do you have any comments about the, the first map, uh, which is spread all around, um, but the Minneapolis and St. Paul, and of course a, a little bit outside of that as well, and I'm, I'm curious, um, and maybe Senator Nelson can speak to that as well. Um, there's a purple area um, that's there that I see that's next to Medicine Lake that's in Plymouth, and that surprises me. So why would Plymouth? Oh, Senator Rust. Senator so Dietz. In my recollection from my previous job, there is um, along that 494 loop, and right out there, there are a bunch of, um, at least in the past, there have been some um, 
mixed income workforce housing, low income housing out that area. Uh, so, um, and some commercial development there. So that's where um, I had the same question. Then I looked at where it was and I remembered, oh, nope, there's some um, apartment developments out there that, um, so I'm assuming there is a minority population out there. And then if you look at, I'll take the northern half. Um, it is a lot of Senator Champion's district on the north side. Um, I have um, part of my lower northeast Minneapolis district where you have a um, economically diverse and racially diverse, um, more lower income, moderate income community. It goes into Senator Kunish's district in Fridley and Columbia Heights. It goes up into Senator Paz's district, um, into the Brooklands and possibly part of um, I think it's mostly Senator Paz's district. And then you go into St. Paul, St. Paul, um, and all the way out to Tujong's district in Maplewood. Um, and then down to Cottage Grove is uh, Senator Seberger and Invergrove Heights areas, um, I believe, Senator Klein. So I know some of those areas also have a racially diverse mm -hmm. and economically diverse communities. Um. These are fascinating maps, um, even if they weren't being used um, as uh, support for your bill, <laughs> uh, Senator Nelson. But um, they're very, very interesting. Um, Madam Chair. Very interesting maps. Mm -hmm. Senator Nelson. Might I just add, as we're on the maps, I also think looking at the statewide map is quite interesting as well. So the insets are important, but when you look at the statewide map, you can get kind of an overall view as well. And I think uh, Senator Driskowski has some of that purple area down on the southern border area there. I think uh, that might be Fillmore County, perhaps Houston County. Uh, and so those are uh, counties that would certainly have a large, uh, could have a large uh, impact from um, equity investment. Okay, is there, um, thank you very much, Senator Nelson. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and you know, just Senator Nelson, very clear, I'm not, I'm not speaking in opposition, I'm just, I just think um, working through these policy questions is important when, t when tax credit ideas come up um, so, that, so that we don't, like I said before, labor under the um, mm -hmm. impression that we're mobilizing private funds we're, we're reimbursing private investments is what we're doing. We're mobilizing public funds, um, which may be fantastic. Um, and I think probably the, one of the strongest arguments that have been made is the fact that there's already a, a federal um, program in place, and this would bolster uh, that um, and would bring some of those federal tax credits. The other thing I would be interested in understanding more as we look at this idea I assume this is a, a proposal for possible future inclusion in mm -hmm. some future bill, um, is because uh, we talked a lot about investments that come in from the private sector. Are those who are investing in these businesses uh, looking to recoup the entirety of their investments through this mechanism um, or just partially? I mean, are we fully reimbursing what folks bring um, uh, in as, as contributions, as support for these businesses. Um, you know, obviously, if they're coming in with an equity position, they're looking to make money from those businesses as investors. But, you know, the principle that they initially bring, are they looking for full investment of those dollars or full reimbursement of those dollars or just a, a partial recoup through this public support mechanism? So we don't have to answer the question today, but... We could, Madam Chair. Go right ahead, Senator um, Nelson or, or Mr. Um, Mr. Ponick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Dibble, it, yes, the, the benefit to the businesses as far as financing goes is one of two ways. You either get debt financing or equity, and the whole goal is flexible financing, and it's whatever the business needs at that juncture. If you're a, uh, if you're a growing business and you might have taken advantage of the angel tax credit and now you've outgrown it and you can't find your financing, you might want to give up a 5 or 10% equity stake in your business so you have totally flexible capital. But if you're a, a business that's at 70 employees, like the one I mentioned, you might want a debt investment. And when you get that, the benefit of the credit is to get them 50% uh, less, a lower interest rate than what they can get at a local bank, or uh, at least five uh, flexible terms, a higher loan to value ratio, a longer amortization schedule, uh, whatever the business needs. So the, the benefit of the credit is really flowing to 
lower cost of capital and more flexible terms for those businesses that need it. Senator Nelson, final comment? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for the uh, robust discussion. Um, and I'll be more than willing to, uh, it, it, is, it, is an, it isn't new, but it's a new concept to Minnesota. I think there's a lot of potential here, and I'll be glad to convene and, uh, a, a, a meeting for those who are interested uh, for further discussion. I would just say it's so, just this past Saturday, I had a meeting with a small business owner in Rochester. Uh, and it was just a, a mom and a pop shop, somewhat new, I would say, probably in the last seven years. And they, I didn't tell them about this bill yet, but I'm thinking about what they were concerned about is just some investment in that small business, um, and how do they how do they access that funding? And that was one of the things they talked about. How do we access funding for our small business? And this is something that could help some of these, uh, particularly smaller businesses, as they seek to expand. And so I appreciate the good time given today, Madam Chair, and uh, look forward to further uh, conversations. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Senator Nelson, and your witnesses, and um, Senate File. 1512 is laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> the next bill on our agenda is Senate Bill Number 973, um, Senator Weber. <clears throat> Senator Weber, you have a an author's amendment, would you like to um, offer that now before we begin on the bill? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I would uh, I would offer the, I believe it's the A-1 amendment. Senator um, Weber moves the A-1 amendment. Um, it's in everybody's packet. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The... Um, Amendment motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Um, uh, Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for hearing Senate File 973. And uh, Madam Chair and members, this bill is basically a compilation of some three provisions that were included in last year's property tax subcommittee report and eventually were part of the uh, conference report uh, that unfortunately was, was not adopted. Um, and basically, uh, there were three separate bills that went into this, this bill. Uh, one was the residential homestead exemption, which was carried by you, Madam Chair. Uh, the other was the resort homestead exemption, which was carried by former State Senator Kerry Root. And, and the final one was the ag homestead exemption, which was carried by myself. Uh, it is the ag homestead exemption amount that is the uh, result or is the uh, intent of the um, amendment to change. Uh, the original amount was at $2.5 million. Um, the agricultural homestead amount is, is, uh, was established in, I believe it was in 2010, and uh, at $1.14 million. And it's been adjusted every year since then. And, and, and for the 23 uh, tax year or assessment year, uh, the first tier valuation has been raised to 2.15 million. And nonpartisan staff found out that for next year it would be going even higher due to the substantial increase we've seen in property values. Uh, so that is the result, reason that I have amended that to go to 3.5 million. And basically, going through each of these individually, what this does is that. Uh, it moves a portion of the value, a larger portion of the valuation uh, into a first tier valuation amount, uh, which is taxed at a lower rate. And the tier limits uh, for that uh, become 0.5% uh, for uh, the agricultural property uh, instead of 1.2.5%. Uh, and or to 1% for the 1.25%. And, um, and this uh, then also is applied to the other property classes. Uh, as we talk about the uh, resort homestead <coughs> amounts, 
Uh, we're actually raising that first tier valuation from six hundred to eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and the uh, and the market value uh, then uh, and that's for tier one, and the market value from eight hundred fifty thousand and one dollar to three point one million for tier two, and then any property over uh, the the three point one million uh, remains subject to state uh, general levy. Uh, and in the homestead uh, market value exclusion uh, itself, it's basically a 25% increase. Uh, for, and so what that means is that uh, currently uh, properties, the first $95,000 of value, or the first $76,000 of value, uh, the exclusion is equal to 40%. Uh, this raises that to $95,000. And then there's a reduction of that amount as the values of properties rise, and it finally uh, removes itself once a property, residential property hits $517,200. The current limit is $413,800. Now, when you deal with property taxes, anytime you start, we start to change uh, the amount of property taxes collected and, and in change the exclusion amounts, we create a shift onto our commercial industrial properties. So this bill also includes a $35 million reduction in the state general levy. The state general levy is the only amount of real estate tax dollars that the state of Minnesota collects. And, it's, uh, and the state general levy is applied to commercial industrial properties, and it's applied to seasonal recreational properties. And in the bill, there's a reduction in both areas to, to take care of that shift amount. Uh, the one, there is one element, however, Madam Chair and members, that uh, is not covered in this bill. And the first $150,000 of commercial industrial value does not pay the state general levy. We raised that a couple of years ago uh, to $150,000. And so that particular category of commercial industrial property would see a shift upwards of their property taxes because of this bill. I have visited with nonpartisan staff, Madam Chair, and I uh, thank you to Troy Olson, uh, who represents the Minnesota Association of County Officers, has put me in touch uh, with a county assessment uh, official, uh, and we're currently working on how we can offset that shift uh, for that class of property. Uh, and so at some point, I assume it's your intention to lay this bill over, Madam Chair. Uh, I may would ask for, uh, at some point, future time, uh, to bring it off the table so we can address that issue further. Uh, but I do recognize that that is a challenge. And the last thing I wish to do, Madam Chair and members, is to create uh, additional hardships on our small businesses. Uh, the supply chain issues, the inflation that's being caused by federal policy, and, and some of the issues that are even coming up with policies in this legislative session are areas that our small businesses are having to deal with, and I do not wish to add to that problem uh, from a real estate tax standpoint. Uh, so, Madam Chair, that is a brief uh, synopsis of this bill. Uh, there are various testifiers uh, that are, I have brought today from both uh, the resort um, uh, consideration and the re residential and the ag considerations, and as well as some uh, testifiers uh, for business. And I stand ready for questions and to have them prepare their or present their testimony, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Senator Weber. Um, we do have um, um, uh, other bills, as you're well aware, particularly that deal with the market value exclusion. And at some point, we may start comparing um, the, um, uh, the thresholds and the limits and the phase-outs that are in your bill as part of a general category if we're going to move forward uh, to um, increase the uh, market value exclusion. The uh, challenge will be, um, as you're pointing out, um, how do we avoid, and I'll just say unnecessary, shifts onto other uh, classes of, of property. And that, um, that is always a, a, a challenge for us when we're dealing with um, uh, class rate um, uh, changes um, as well as in this instance in the third category, the market value exclusion. But um, 
as far as I know, un unlike the governor's bill, which we don't have uh, yet, but it's coming soon. We, we, now we know it's really coming soon. Um, there's not a lot of policy uh, or revenue impact of any kind on property tax issues. The governor has um, concentrated on, um, uh, other than uh, LGA and CPA, the governor has not concentrated or focused on the workings of the actual property tax system itself. His focus has been in, in, uh, uh, in the income tax area and individual taxpayers. So uh, just wanted to provide that, that framework as we, uh, as we go forward. Any um, questions for uh, Senator Weber before we turn to his testifier? Senator uh, Putnam. Uh, just a, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Weber, just a quick comment that I appreciate you doing this. Uh, I was talking to a, uh, a dairy farmer in Avon uh, a couple weeks ago who uh, told me that uh, he bought his property for $600 an acre, and now it's $6,000 an acre. There are a lot of people out there farming right now who are uh, property prosperous but cash-strapped. Uh, and I think that uh, anything we can do to help farmers in that situation is a, is a useful thing for us to work on. So thank you for doing this. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, the first testifier today on, uh, on the agenda is, is Joel Carlson, who is here. And I believe he has a couple of resort owners here that he wishes to introduce. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Carlson, welcome to the, um, the committee. And we're... Uh, pleased to have your testimony. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members. It's a pleasure to be back in, in front of you in person uh, once again. I want to uh, thank Senator Weber for carrying forward uh, this important issue for, uh, on behalf of the resort community. I own a legal research and government affairs business in St. Paul, and I've long represented the community of Minnesota resorts. And it is an association of family-owned resorts across Minnesota. They're not in every district. Senator Weber, I think, has the only county in the state that doesn't have a lake, uh, Rock County. Uh, uh, but he has carried on this uh, uh, cause for us, and I appreciate it uh, very much, because resorting is a quality of life issue in Minnesota and is central to tourism uh, in many parts of our state. And while uh, you may think it doesn't impact your district because you don't have a resort in your district, I can tell you that resorts are the way your constituents and thousands of Minnesotans are able to affordably enjoy our outstanding resources in Minnesota. So we believe that resorts uh, impact all of Minnesota and we appreciate Senator Weber bringing this forward. Um, you know, we used to have almost 3,000 resorts in Minnesota in the late 1960s. We are down to about 700 right now. And once a resort is sold for private development, it never comes back. And that has an impact when a resort leaves a community on the grocery store, the bait shop, the hardware store. Uh, it impacts the economy uh, in that community in a significant way. And so the legislature has taken steps to help the resorting industry stay in business because they are viable businesses that help everyone in their community. And it was in 2005 in this conference room that Senator Dietzik's um, a predecessor, Senator Pogamiller, who also doesn't have a resort in his district, led the charge to change the tier system uh, that we have now for taxing resorts. Uh, Senator Abrams didn't like that compromise in the special session in 2005 and told me never to come back. <laughs> and he was kind of right. The tiers have not been adjusted since. There was one small adjust, uh, conforming adjustment in 2008, but the tiers have never been adjusted in 18 years. And as you know, and you'll hear from Mr. Worley remotely, um, uh, the, the property value increase on Lakeshore property uh, has been dramatic, and it does impact the, these businesses' ability to stay in business. They have about a three-month season to make their business operate. Most of the members of my association are seasonal. 
They do not operate in the winter months. There's very little uh, um, uh, usage in May before the fishing season starts. And so their property taxes are their single most, uh, their single largest expense and everything that you can do uh, to help adjust them is greatly appreciated. So uh, with that, Madam Chair, I know uh, Mr. Worley wanted to be here in person but had to um, um, testify remotely and I think he's queued up and ready to go. Thank you, Mr. Carlson. Um, Mr. Jim Worley, are you, um, are you with us? Welcome to the Hi, uh, welcome to the committee. If you'd identify yourself for the record, my name is Jim Worley. Uh, my wife and I own Sunset Bay Resort in Otter Tail County on uh, Dead Lake, and we have owned the resort for ten years. Um, we are your what I'll say typical one C classified homestead resort. We uh, own, operate, and live on the resort. It is a seasonal resort that operates primarily mid-May through October 1st. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify today. Uh, resorts in Minnesota uh, are primarily in your you know, rural areas. Uh, we are what we consider economic drivers for those areas, bringing in uh, new tourism dollars to those areas every week. Uh, those help support our uh, associate tourism members uh, that are friends of ours, uh, like the gas stations, the grocery stores, the the shops, and, and all of the associated tourism industry in those small towns. When you lose a resort, it never comes back. Uh, the property tax valuations on properties such as resorts, uh, we're on very attractive property that sits on the lakeside. Uh, as you can see behind me, I put up a shot of my lakeshore. It's 550 feet of pristine sand um, on 15 acres. It's very attractive property to redevelop into uh, residential. And with the increase in valuations that have occurred over the years, that's what's happened. Many of the resorts have, have sold and they've either either turned into what's called a community in common where they split up the acreage and, and develop it uh, with the existing cabins that are there or they demolish the cabins and it becomes residential, eliminating the opportunity for people to enjoy Minnesota's resources without having to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars in their own property to build a home. For example, uh, as Joel said, the valuations haven't changed since 2008 or the tier levels haven't changed, but those assessed values have gone up dramatically. Through COVID, uh, an interesting uh, dynamic occurred. Lakeshore properties and all properties really uh, that were attractive uh, went up in dramatic fashion. People that could work from the home, wanted to get to a property that was attractive to them and that they could buy. Uh, that drove up property values on the lakeside dramatically because people who used to want that office view downtown wanted the office view from the lake. My property as an example, and I think it's very typical of the 1C resort properties, from 2022 to 2023, our uh, assessed value um, changed 39%. It went up over half a million dollars in one year. And that, that is typical of many of the resorts that classify as 1C because of the attractiveness of the property on the lake and because of the sales that have occurred around us in the surrounding community during the last two years. And that's just a one year occurrence. It doesn't even account for the occurrence from 2008 when the tiers were adjusted previously up to 2023. What's happening too, as Joel said, there used to be over 3000 resorts in the state. And now they're, he said about 700, according to the Explore Minnesota Tourism Research, research Reports, there are now 646 resorts as of their most recent year, 2020. Those resorts produced sales tax revenue of $18 million 
in 2020, which was down um, 1.4 million. It's the first time in 10 years that that revenue has dropped. The number of re resorts from 2019 to 2020 fell 37, a 5.1% uh, decrease. Now, some of those I'll point out couldn't open. For example, the Northwest Angle, um, you couldn't access those resorts in 2020 because of COVID. They were on the Canadian side and the Canadians did not open their, uh, allow the people to get to those resorts, even though they were on Minnesota soil, you can only access them through Canada. So some of those resorts didn't open, but um, to drop 37 resorts in one year is dramatic. Um, and, and the industry is experiencing that every year. That decline has happened over the last 15 years. Every year, the number goes down of the resorts that are available for people to use. Um, most of those sales losses over the last, uh, from 19 to 20, were reported by Explore Minnesota to be in central Minnesota though, which is interesting. Um, because they're also losing resorts. It's not just your rural areas, your smaller areas. It's it's also the Brainerds and and the Bemidji's and areas that are typically high in tourism and have a, a large number of resorts. Otter Tail County, since 1985, we have we now have 59 resorts where we used to have 126 in 1985, and even more prior to that. So the adjustment of the tiers is, is something that we feel is very important. Um, the valuations continue to increase. Uh, we operate as, as a seasonal basis and appreciate the fact that um, a bill was recognized for that back when, when this was initiated. And um, I'll open it up for any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Uh... Mr. Worley, we appreciate your testimony and the um, and the good statistics that you provided. I think um, in all of these um, areas, we need to keep in mind too that some some um, uh, drops in economic activity were definitely affected by COVID, even though um, there may have been um, a increasingly downward curve in, in uh, profitability or so forth um, or expensiveness um, that was occurring independent of, um, of, uh, of COVID. So we really appreciate your testimony. The next person, um, oh, uh, Senator Miller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just took a quick look at the website for Sunset Bay Resort. Looks like a beautiful place and just wanted to highlight and congratulate uh, Mr. Worley on, and his wife on the 2020 Community of Minnesota Resorts Resorter of the uh, Resorter of the Year Award. So they must be doing something right up there in Otterdale County. Right. So just want to congratulate you, Mr. Worley. And I'll give my I'll give my wife all the credit for that. <laughs> and Mr. Worley, um, the rest of us on the committee. Um, we, uh, we joined Senator Miller in uh, congratulating you on, on that designation and award. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, Thank you all very much. Uh, we'll now move to um, Mr. Um, Ager from the Minnesota Association yep. of Realtors. <coughs> Mr. Mr. Ager. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Paul Egger. I'm Senior Vice President of Governmental Affairs for the Minnesota Realtors Association. Uh, we're a statewide uh, business trade association with over 22,000 members working with uh, buyers and sellers of all types of property every day. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of Senator Weber's Senate File 973, which provides property tax relief for several different types of property. I'd also like to thank Senator Weber for bringing the bill forward for discussion today. Uh, our legislative agenda for 2023 includes support for improving, enhancing, and updating state homeowner property tax relief programs. We appreciate you hearing this bill today, Madam Chair, and hope homeowner property tax relief will be a priority for you in your omnibus tax bill later this session. 
With homestead market values increasing due to a chronic shortage of housing supply, a growing number of homeowners in recent years have seen huge increases in their valuations and are concerned about significant property increases in their property tax bills. While the decisions affecting residential property taxes are made at the local level, Minnesota currently has several homeowner property tax relief programs, including the homestead market value exclusion addressed in Section 3 of Senate File 973. Section 3 of this bill would increase the minimum and maximum market value thresholds for the homestead market value exclusion. Uh, those exclusion thresholds are not indexed, Madam Chair, and members of the committee, and have not been increased since the exclusion was created in 2011 to replace the uh, former homestead market value credit. Just for a little bit of context, according to the Minnesota Realtors 2013 annual report on the Minnesota housing market, the statewide median sales price of a home in 2013 was $170,000. In 2022, the statewide median sales price was $326,300, which is about a 90% increase in the median sales price in a nine-year period. Increasing the market value thresholds to account for growth in home values over the years is both a reasonable and a necessary policy response for ensuring the exclusion is providing property tax relief to the homeowners it was intended to help when it was created. While we often talk about getting into home, the barriers to getting into home ownership, such as limited supply of homes and saving for a down payment, rising property taxes represents a barrier to sustainable home ownership for many, and this bill would help. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today and look forward to working with Senator Weber and members of the committee as the session progresses. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Ager. Um, Andrew Dewar. Thank you, thanks. And Sean Smith may, might come up as well at this time. Um, Mr. Dewar, please identify yourself for the record. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Andrew Dewar, and I'm here today representing the uh, Minnesota Soybean Growers Association and the Minnesota Pork Producers Association. Uh, Madam Chair, to, to save you some precious committee time, I've also been authorized to share the uh, uh, support and speak on behalf of the uh, Minnesota Farmers Union, Minnesota Farm Bureau, uh, the Corn Growers Association, Turkey Growers Association, State Cattlemen, uh, the Wheat Growers Association, and the Red River Valley Sugar Beet Growers. Uh, the reason that, that this uh, bill is so important to uh, so many of us in the agriculture community is that uh, while Senator Weber said earlier that the, uh, the egg homestead valuation limit is indexed by the Department of Revenue each year, uh, it really hasn't kept up with what a commercially viable uh, farm looks like in the state of Minnesota. Uh, to give members an idea of, of what a farm looks like that's covered under uh, the current valuation limit, uh, we estimate that at 2.7 million, which is the current uh, egg homestead valuation cap, uh, that on average around the state is about a 250 acre farm. Uh, now that's gonna vary across the state. Uh, in Senator Weber's district, which has probably the most expensive egg land in the state, that would be significantly smaller. And then in other areas of the state where, where egg land is not as high, it would be bigger, but that's, that's roughly the average. And, and under Senate file uh, 973, if we raise that uh, to, to a $3.5 million uh, limit, uh, we figure that would add, on, again on average, about 80 acres uh, to, the, to the average homestead, so to roughly 330. And uh, last year's numbers that I found for what the USDA said the average farm in the state of Minnesota is at, and this is not, this is all farms, not commercially viable farms, that the average farm in the state of Minnesota is about 377 acres. So even with this bill, uh, the homestead would, would uh, cover a, a below average uh, size of a farm. Uh, in conclusion, I just wanted to, to uh, emphasize the significance of this bill. Um, it, the farmers that I represent in the associations I'm here today speaking on behalf of, we have a lot of many, many farmers in that two, three, four, 500 acre uh, range. And the, the skyrocketing prices are putting a lot of pressure on, on their decision to keep farming. And, and each one would tell you that uh, this will make a significant difference in their decision to, to keep farming that land at that, at that level. So uh, with that, Madam Chair, uh, that concludes my comments, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Mr. Dewar. Um, Senator Dijek. Um, thank you, Madam President. My question isn't for um, Mr. Dewar, so I'll wait in case somebody else has a question on that. Okay. Anybody have a question for Mr. Dewar? 
Apparently not. So if you want to ask um, Senator Weber. Um, Senator Weber or um, Mr. Carlson might be able to address this. So um, I know I've had family members that have used both Ganja Resorts over the summer and also use Airbnbs, VBROs a lot. And so I'm just wondering what is the, what has the impact on Airbnb, VBROs been on the seasonal racks? Has anybody looked at how that's impacting resorts? And then do they pay different tax structures? Are they taxed differently from a property tax point of view or any additional tax? Mr. Carlson. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Dietzik. Um, while we haven't changed the, the tax tiers for a long time, the legislature did address the tax disparity between resorts and vacation rental homes. Uh, I believe it was, maybe Mr. Sylvia can help me, but I believe it was that first session during COVID uh, in 2020 when you adjusted um, the people that rent out their property uh, as lodging. They are now taxed similar to resorts. I won't say they're exactly the same, but the people that are doing it more than two weeks and advertise for the public, you made that change, and um, uh, and so they are now uh, more on par with uh, with how resorts are taxed, and particularly the ones that don't live uh, at their uh, VRBO. Some of them are still owner-occupied, and that's a little bit different, but they, you did address it, and we appreciate that very much. Mr. Sylvia, would you like to uh, uh, comment on the details of that change that we made? Uh, Madam Chair and, and members, um, correct, the change was made during the 2020 uh, legislative session and we created a new property tax classification. Um, we expanded the definition of what is a 4B1 classification to, to uh, specifically target the short-term rental properties. Um, the definition is to include short-term rental property that is rented for more than 14 days in the preceding year. Um, rent for a period of less than 30 consecutive days, and the um, unit must contain four or more sleeping units. Um, we provide a classification rate of 1.25% for that new class. And it's just a one tier, or one class rate. Um, thank you. Anything further, Senator Dietzik? Okay. Um, then we have uh, Mr. Smith from N NIOP. And then Ms. Ms. Kadoon, if you want to step up as well. Mr. Smith, uh, welcome to the committee. If you would identify yourself for the record. Good morning, Chair Rust and tax committee members. My name is Sean Smith. I'm the public policy committee chair for NAOP Minnesota. NAOP is the leading organization for commercial real estate owners and developers. And in this role, I am uh, proudly serving as a volunteer today. Um, regarding this bill, uh, 973, I think it's, it's, um, it's hard not to appreciate the tax relief um, in this, in the environment that we've talked about. So thank you, Senator Weber. Um, I am testifying today to elaborate upon the concerns from the potential unintentional effects to properties that are not addressed in this bill. Um, in Minnesota, as most of you probably know, we tax property at different rates through their designated classifications. There are five main classifications in there. The actual property tax that a owner or a business pays is largely driven by the budgets of the various municipalities, so think city, counties, and schools. Um, and that's important because I've heard uh, um, valuations are, are the reason for the taxes. Along with valuation, classification is the main way that we divvy up the burden of these taxes. It's an equation, and, and put simply, any property tax relief to one class will result in property tax increase for the other classes. So where should we be concerned? Ultimately, for properties that have higher classification rates than those addressed in this bill and predominantly classification 3A or CNI properties. These are taxed at the highest classification rate and are approximately two to four times the rate of the aggregate of the agricultural and residential properties covered in this bill. Put simply again, property tax relief uh, that is in this bill, um, that is covered in this bill, uh, will result in an increase to CNI properties at the same rate of two to five times the savings of those properties that are addressed in this bill. 
our classification system magnifies these impacts. As a percent of total rent, Minnesota businesses do have the highest property taxes in the nation, according to our recent 50 market study. And this is mainly due to this classification rate, but also the state general levy that adds approximately 30% onto a tax bill in our state. Um, this is a very unique tax. Uh, medians the, and, and um, small and medium businesses are predominantly paying this tax. For example, the median sized business in the metro is less than 1,200 square feet. Meanwhile, corporations that have already figured this out are either relocating or expanding in lower cost states. Real estate taxes are a fixed cost to these businesses and they are a big factor in, in how businesses assess their space needs. Um, and CNI properties are facing headwinds today. Most recent market surveys report that we now have over 20% vacancy in the office buildings and we, and we have historically high construction costs and on top of that, the interest rates. So new private investment is very challenging today. While these changes um, are welcome to the property types that are identified in this bill, I do urge you to consider further reduction in the state general levy or in the classification rate to 3A properties, not only as a way to more accurately offset the impacts, but also to provide relief to the many businesses who have made our state's growing surplus possible. Thank you, Chair Rust, Senator Weber, and I appreciate uh, the allotted time today and I can make myself available for questions. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Smith. Ms. Kadoon. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Beth Kadoon. I represent the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. I want to thank Senator Weber for bringing forth this bill and doing the um, reducing further the state business property tax levy. As was mentioned, that's the extra tax paid by businesses in addition to all their local property taxes. Um, as was mentioned, this is a very high cost of doing business in Minnesota. And this has been cited by our members as really impeding a headwind to growth and investment in our state. Just to give you a, a sense of what this means as how we compare to other states, there's a great 50 state comparison study that's done by the Lincoln Institute and the Minnesota Center of Fiscal Excellence. And it shows when you just look at our bordering communities with a $1 million commercial um, property value, Minnesota's property tax is about $40,000. Um, you'd pay $25,000 less for a comparable pro property in North Dakota or South Dakota. You would be paying um, about um, $10,000 less in I Iowa and $13,000 $13, less in Wisconsin. You'd even pay less in California and New York. So we have a very high fixed cost of doing business in the state for the property tax. As you know, this is also regressive tax. So as you move forward, we encourage you to look at ways to further reduce the state levy. Um, I'd also mention concerns that were mentioned um, um, regarding shifting that will occur to other property taxpayers. This obviously, if you look at the revenue estimate, just with the homestead market value exclusion, it will result in a another $11 billion um, increase in that exclusion. So another $11 billion that will be shifted onto other property taxpayers, including other homeowners, apartments, um, and especially those small businesses as was mentioned by Chair Weber, I appreciate him looking at how you can mitigate those costs to those um, lower market valued properties um, on the business tax as well. So thank you and we'll look forward to working with the committee. Um, thank you very much, Ms. Kadoon. Any uh, questions or comments for the witnesses? Um, Senator Weber, you wanna finish up? Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, oh, Senator Nelson. Excuse me, Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. I did have some comments. Sure, um, I, I, I'm almost missed my chance there. Um, you know, I, I just wanted to zero in on this misnamed statewide general levy. Uh, you know, members, that was instituted, and, and I think uh, um, Mr. Sylvia can probably give us the exact date. But wh why did this come about? This additional misnamed property tax on our commercial entities came about at a time of a deficit. It was what some of our previous governors would have called a gimmick to balance our state budget. And yet, members, this has continued on and on. And we're in a time of massive uh, budget surplus now. And at the same time, though, our Main Street uh, Minnesota businesses 
that, um, that are, are critical to every city and town in the state are not only stuck with an additional 30% on top of their normal property taxes, that it just comes right up here to the dome. It just comes right up here to the capital. And our businesses are struggling. Not only are they struggling with supply chain issues and massive inflation um, and workforce issues, they're struggling with the escalation of e-commerce that happened during the pandemic. And so I just want to uh, thank Senator Weber for bringing uh, particularly this part of the bill. I think it's just incumbent upon us at this time of massive surplus to for once and all, we've been nipping around the edges here since I got here on this, but I'm hoping, uh, Madam Chair and committee, as we go forward, we'll be able to actually at this particular time, uh, it, it seems like the very, um, appropriate and needed time to totally eliminate this statewide general levy. Maybe I'm going a little bit further than what uh, Senator Weber's asking, but just had to had to mention that. Thank you. Well, Senator Nelson, I'm not going to I'm not going to get into it, but my recollection of why we have the statewide business property tax is very different than yours um, and was part of the um, uh, reform so-called that we were doing uh, in the early 2000s and um, that we were asked by the business community with regard to local property taxes to uh, come up with something different um, to pay for education. And we did. Um, and the, um, um, the, that statewide business property tax was uh, the first year going solely and completely to education, to K-12 education, and um, uh, passed under uh, Governor Ventura. And um, the very next year, the first year of um, Governor Pawlenty's um, administration, um, he repealed that and made it part of um, the general fund to support all of Minnesota government, so it was, it was devoted, and um, and um, I don't, I don't know, it, it accepted is the right word, but understood uh, when it was passed that it was going to um, uh, relief on one side, so that uh, uh, some businesses and some school districts were really being heavily taxed, that. It was now going to be spread uh, with a levy over all the state, all commercial industrial property. Um, and even at the time, um, I, I warned, um, and I even had a quote in a paper, <laughs> that if we're not willing to um, otherwise, in times of trouble, uh, to raise income taxes to support our public schools, this reform will fail. Well, it failed within one year. It failed with one year, and that's why we have it. Um, and um, uh, and you're right, we're stuck with it right now. Uh, but um, I do think that the, um, we've made some improvements in it with regard to who bears the burden. That's a question we always need to ask um, in any in any uh, property tax uh, issue, and we stopped paying for um, uh, shifts. We don't pay for shifts anymore. If something is moving within the uh, class rates, we let the shift occur and hope that it is um, a minor one, uh, for example, like in 4D property. But um, uh, that is... Um, that's the dangers of uh, trying to reform a system that then is not supported in, uh, in, in future years. Um, but certainly, the complaints never stop. We know, we know that. The complaints never stop. But um, I appreciate what, um, I appreciate the approach, Senator Weber, that you're making here of uh, finding a different way of um, mitigating the, the shift, and uh, that's probably something that we should look at in the future, too. Senator Dibble. 
Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you said everything I was going to say, but I'll just add just a tiny bit more, which is I think it would be interesting if we do contemplate um, you know, total elimination of the state general levy um, for uh, commercial industrial as well as cabins, that we um, uh, do two things. One is um, uh, do an analysis retroactive to the point at which the change was made in 2001 um, to show what would have been paid mm -hmm. um, all of this time versus what has been paid. And also um, just remind ourselves um, how we have tamped down um, through alternative indices the rate of increase of the state general levy in response to requests from the business community rather than keying off of property value, for example, going with CI and mechanisms like that, which has, has, has tamped down the, the rate of, of additional. Um, and, and I'll just make one final point um, to your point about, you know, it was supposed to be the second Minnesota miracle in 2001. Didn't which uh, I anticipated uh, was the commitment wasn't going to follow through with future uh, appropriations out of the general fund um, to take pressure off of property tax. Remember, we did also did the um, compression of, of CI as well as uh, um, some uh, multifamily residential, um, <clears throat> and uh, it didn't materialize. And I think before long, we were back to relying heavily on on the local levies, kind of undid everything that was done within just a few years. Um, but, um, uh, you, know, the, you know, the business community does pay taxes in, in, in different ways as well, but this was one of the mechanisms um, which, which they also paid for public education, which they have an interest in supporting. Uh, we hear a lot about uh, uh, workforce issues and, and finding folks who are ready for the jobs that are being created in the state, the business community. This is, this is where a public good um, is, is delivered that has a, a lot of private benefit, um, which the business community continually, even though it's going into the general fund, it finds its way to ed public education you know, in some lesser uh, degree. And it is something that um, I would hope the corporate and business community would continue to be interested in supporting. Thank you, Madam Chair. Th uh, thank you, Senator Dibble. And you know, the um, one of the other um, issues that has plagued the calculation of the um, statewide levy is uh, whether to imply whether to apply an inflation factor, which has happened in, uh, at, in the early years, and then or whether to set an amount that represents a need um, as part of the um, overall contribution of the business property taxes to the well-being uh, um, of our state. Um, Senator Draskowski, I'm going to call on you, but I, but, um, I'm, I also um, have a bill that I want to present, so I want to get to that, if you don't mind. Senator Draskowski. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just quickly, I'm wondering if staff can tell us how much uh, the general levy is still at uh, after we've had these reductions now. 150. The total, um, Mr. Sylvia, the total general um, levy for um, business property statewide? Uh, Madam Chair Sandrowskowski, right now the state general levy is separated into two amounts, one for the commercial industrial uh, properties and one for seasonal recreational properties. For taxes payable in 2023, the state levy for CI property is $716.9 million. And for seasonal recreational property uh, for taxes payable in 2023, it is 41.6. Uh, those numbers, as Senator Russ indicated, are no longer updated for inflation. So unless those are changed, those are the numbers that would continue in the future. Thank you, Mr. Selby. Thank you, Madam Chair. So it sounds like 1.6 per biennium or something like that, and we've got a $18 billion over collection. I'm, I second uh, Senator Nelson's motion, Madam Chair. Thank you. <laughs> Just have to get the history straight. That's it, uh, Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a just a reminder. Uh, also included in my property tax bill last year was a ten-year removal of the state general levy, uh, ten percent a year from then on. Um, and in just to give an indication of what our property taxes have done, 
Uh, last year, when I proposed this, uh, I had included $26 million reduction in the state general levy to pay for the shift. This year, it takes $35 million, or million so a $9 million increase uh, just to cover the shift as a result of the increased property taxes that we're seeing. Uh, if we look at the levy increase or the value increases that have occurred uh, for agricultural property, agricultural homestead properties, for agricultural house, those values from 21 to 22, and the 22 values are what will form the basis of the 23 property tax statements that will be going out within the next month and a half or so. Um, that, that increases 12.8%. For agricultural homestead land, that increase was 15.3%. For seasonal recreational properties, the increase was 23.5% in one year. And, and for the homestead market value for residential properties, if on a statewide basis, the increase was 17.8%. Averages always have lower numbers and they also have higher numbers uh, because um, uh, Senator Putnam mentioned the $6,000 farm in his district. I had a farm last year, bare land, a short quarter, that sold for $19,700 an acre. There is no development potential. It is pure farmland. There were no buildings. It is bare land. And, and so by the time you add a working farm site onto that, that farm could, by, with 100, I'll just go to 160 acres, a quarter section, could exceed the $3.5 million I am asking for within this bill. And the reality of it is uh, our property tax system changes continually, our values change continually, and uh, we'll always be behind the eight ball, Madam Chair, in terms of what we are doing. But one of the reasons I have brought in the assessment official to talk about that, that unintended shift for those properties under 150,000 is we also have to come up with a system that can work for those individuals who have to implement the legislation that we pass, that being our assessing officials. And so, uh, Madam Chair, again, I thank you. I thank my testifiers. Uh, who testified on this bill. Uh, we will continue to work on those areas that are, uh, are uh, problematic in terms of uh, a shift. And, and if you would so desire, uh, Madam Chair, I would gladly amend my bill to also include uh, the 10 year removal of the general property tax levy. <laughs> well, thank you for the offer. <laughs> um, uh, thank you again, uh, Senator Weber and um, um, Senate file uh, 973 will be laid over for consideration. Welcome to the committee, Senator Rest. Senate file 1444 is before the uh, committee to your bill. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and members. Senate file 1444 um, proposes a sales tax exemption for um, the storage of, uh, of firearms. Um, a while ago, it um, I was thinking about how could the tax committee um, promote gun safety? And um, the only thing I could come up with was, are there items um, used by gun owners, <clears throat> excuse me, that um, uh, we could encourage the safety of their firearms by giving them a, uh, a sales tax exemption? And that is what this, this bill does. We use um, the definition of firearm uh, from the Game and Fish um, section of the statutes. That's 97015. That's line 113. Um, uh, rather than the narrower uh, criminal statute definition. And um, the um, it doesn't end up putting a 
too much of a dent in the, the, um, uh, in the general fund. However, it seems to me that it's, um, it is, uh, so it ends up maybe being more symbolic than real, but I would like to think that if someone goes in and buys a firearm, it's, it's, it's broad definition, almost anything comes under this, and buys a safe or, or some sort of um, storage unit for, for their firearms that if the seller can say, and by the way, you don't have to pay sales tax on it. So that can be six and a half to eight percent of the savings on um, on the storage unit. So um, so I offer uh, Senate file uh, 1444 um, in that spirit and appreciate the support of Senator Duckworth, Putnam, Seaberger, and, and Lang. Thank you, Senator Rest. And I see you don't have amendments or testifiers. Are there member it's comments or questions? It's just me. <laughs> Senator Dreskowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the bill. Um, this is um, it's a wonderful bill. It's, a, it's the first time I've seen a Democrat carry a, a bill that around firearms that gun owners will like. Um, I think we should pass this by unanimous consent. Just send it to the floor, Madam Chair. Um, I, uh, that would be my inclination as well, but we're not going to do that, Senator Shuskowski. <laughs> it does have a cost, and, um, and uh, you'd be surprised at some of the ideas that Democrats have. And I hope you'll continue to be surprised, just as I am by by um, sometimes very progressive notions that come out of the mouths of Republicans. So Senator Nelson. that goes both ways. <laughs> th th thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Russ, I too think this is a wonderful bill. I think it's innovative in its approach. And while you noted that it has a negligible impact on our, uh, on our state, um, it has a negative or a very small uh, revenue estimate, you know, I think it's a really important bill because if it saves one life where a toddler or a teen doesn't accidentally get to a gun, this, is a, this can have a huge, huge impact. Uh, and so I thank you for bringing it. I think it's a great, great sure. bill. You'll see it again. Good. Okay. Um, Senator uh, Dibble. Um, uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for the bill. Um, yeah, I see the uh, the revenue estimate is around twenty thousand um, dollars, but I hope it costs more because I hope it really does incent a lot more folks uh, to buy a storage unit that that can be locked and uh, put those in their home, so we can avoid um, unfortunate accidents that we read about from time to time in the paper and many, many more that happen that we don't even hear about. So um, so I hope the 20,000 proves to be a dramatic underestimate of the cost of this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, uh, Senator Dibble and um, members of the committee. Uh, Senator Klein, if you would uh, lay the bill over and then um, adjourn the committee, I would appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Senator Rest. Uh, with that, the Senate file 1444 four is laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus, uh, and the committee is adjourned.